So, uh, Hi, good morning, everybody. Let me try that again. Good morning. <laughs> I, I hate when they do that, but I, I felt the need to do it while standing here. Um, so my name is Scott Bernstein. I'm a senior policy analyst at the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. And uh, I'm just going to take a, a brief moment before we start the plenary uh, to talk about this card that we put on left on your seats. Uh, so our coalition is a national group of 70 or so organizations across Canada uh, and several thousand individuals and um, we're all advocating for changes in drug policy and so we're, uh, we're the policy end of uh, what happens. We, we work with government uh, to advocate on behalf of things like uh, expansion of harm reduction, decriminalization, legal regulation of drugs um, and the coalition is we invite you to join uh, individually or as an organization and if you'd like to do so you can either do it online or uh, fill out this card drop it off at our booth uh, downstairs uh, if you are joining as an organization uh, I would just ask that maybe like fill the organization's name on the back or or something and so um, really hope you join so uh, great I'm gonna uh, take a second here uh, this, this session the session's going to be bilingual, so um, Marlis gave you a little bit of warning. If you need a, a headset for translation, please go grab that. Do you mind grabbing that, please, while I'm talking? Thank you. Okay. So, um, cannabis. So we have a, a great panel. We're actually we're actually expecting uh, one more panel member, um, and she just indicated she's running a, a bit late, uh, and so she'll join sort of midstream. Um, but. Uh, I wanted to just say a little bit, like, I think we're all aware that on October 17th, which is uh, really less than two weeks from now, Canada will be legalizing uh, cannabis for uh, non-medical, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so non-medical non and non-scientific use, which is often termed recreational use. And so uh, what, what happens then is Canada is going to be the first so-called developed country in the world and the only the second country to federally legalize cannabis. And so despite uh, long-standing liberal cannabis policies in places like the Netherlands and statewide or smaller scale experiments um, that we've seen since 2012 in states like Colorado, Washington, Alaska, Oregon, California, Maine, Nevada, Massachusetts, Vermont, and in Washington, D.C., uh, there's really no question that Canada is, is on the forefront of drug policy reform now with the legalization of, uh, of recreational cannabis. So uh, the history of cannabis prohibition in Canada dates back to about 1923 when its actual use in the country was actually pretty non-existent. And most likely in response to international pressure, Canada added marijuana uh, along with heroin and codeine to its list of scheduled substances and prohibited drugs under an act to prohibit the improper use of opium and other drugs. Um, in reality though, the first, the first seizures of cannabis didn't happen until around the 1940s or 30s, and then between 1941 and 61, uh, really cannabis only accounted for 2% of all drug arrests in Canada. Flash forward to 2017, last year, and we know that 53% of the 90,000 drug arrests in Canada were for cannabis-related offenses, with 42% of all the drug arrests, a total of 38,498, just for possession. So we, we, we really have well documented the harms of criminalization of cannabis, uh, including the stigma that's attached to criminalization, um, the lack of, or the, the effect of having a criminal record on travel or employment opportunities, the racially targeted enforcement by police, uh, which has a disparate effect on black, indigenous, and young Canadians, and you know, the cost of law, law enforcement are uh, taking a lot of money that could be better spent on uh, health public health, harm reduction, other kinds of things. And so, um, and, and largely, uh, the 
fact that cannabis is pro prohibited in Canada fuels a thriving black market that's estimated around six billion dollars. So it's, uh, you know, so that's, those are some of the harms related to criminalization, but we, we know that public opinion changes, and with cannabis, public opinion has really dramatically changed over the years, and now in polling, uh, there are 68% of Canadians support legalization of cannabis in some form. And so, following through on the campaign promise in 2015, the Liberals passed the Cannabis Act, Bill C-45, in June of this year, and uh, as I mentioned, it's going to take, you know, take uh, effect in a couple weeks on October 17th. Um, we've seen also that the federal system that was created is, is actually quite general and it's left a lot of the discretion for how cannabis will be sold, uh, to whom, what age, at the discretion of the provinces and the territories. And so what we're seeing is there's, there's actually be 13 different cannabis systems unrolled in Canada in various stages of, of development. And so the um, federal government cited three main reasons to legalize and regulate cannabis. Better prevent youth from accessing cannabis to displace the illegal cannabis market and to protect public health and safety with product quality and safety requirements for cannabis. So aside from the larger question of like how, how is cannabis legalization going to unfold, uh, there, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger point about what the legalization of cannabis means for drug policy in Canada and, and also internationally. So in the face of an ongoing opioid crisis, and increasingly vocal calls for the government to provide a safe supply of drugs, decriminalize possession of drugs, and legal regulate all drugs to bring them under control. The, the looming presence of cannabis legalization is important both logistically, how it's happening, but also symbolically. Like what, is, what does it mean for a country to go and uh, um, uh, regulate and legally control something that was prohibited? So this morning, uh, we're going to try to unpack the larger meaning of cannabis legalization for you uh, within the Canadian drug policy movement. And um, all right, Jenna's in the house. Come on up. It's great. I haven't started yet. So, um, so I'm really happy. Uh, we've pulled together an a excellent panel of experts, and so I'm really happy to uh, introduce them. So I'll go, I'll go left or right, and Jenna's going to like pop in right when I'm introducing her. So, uh, I can start. <laughs> you, might, you might need your translation stuff, too. It's right behind you. So, um, okay, so right next to me is uh, Rebecca Haynes-Saw. She's a health sociologist in the medical school at the University of Calgary, just down the block, or, well, down, down province, I guess, uh, and conducts uh, qualitative and policy-focused research on youth and cannabis. Sitting next to her is uh, Jean-Sébastien Fallou. He's an associate professor in the School of Psychoeducation at the University of Montreal and the editor of Drogue, Santé et Soci Société journal. Drogue, Santé et Société. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, uh, his research interests include the etiology and prevention of problematic substance use among adolescents as well as related drug policies. Uh, sitting next to Jean-Sébastien is Steve Rolls. He's uh, from the UK. He's a senior policy analyst for Transform Drug Policy Foundation. They're a UK-based think tank and charity focused on drug policy and law and reform. Steve is the lead author on a range of publications focusing on regulating drugs, including um, working as a, a technical coordinator for a recent Global Commission report on regulating drugs. Um, he was an advisor to the Uruguayan government in developing their cannabis regulation model and also for our government uh, in advising the task force on cannabis regulation. And last but certainly not least is uh, Jenna Valeriani. She's a postdoctoral fellow at the BC Center on Substance Use with a qualitative and community-based research team. She's been researching cannabis access in Canada for seven years, and her current work focuses on community-based cannabis substitution programs and the instrumental uses of cannabis among people who use drugs. So a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you for joining. I'll
I'll, I'll stop speaking so much, uh, and now I'd like to get into a bit of discussion with our panelists. So, uh, Rebecca, I'd, I'd like to start with you, and uh, just uh, the first question I want to say is just what do we think of the cannabis system that's unrolling? What are, what are some of the things that you think are, are going to be done well, or some of the things that we think maybe could have been done better and need, uh, need some improvement? I think the thing that frustrates me at, at this point, I'm, I'm glad that you know, municipalities uh, on the ground have the capacity to adapt uh, regulation to their context, but I think we're seeing a bit of a patchwork, and I think it's going to be very confusing to people to know when and where they can smoke cannabis or consume otherwise edibles or vape. And in my city of Calgary, we have an outright ban. And, and some of the uh, rationale for this that we've heard in the public health community is, well, now we've legalized cannabis, but we have to uh, keep it totally socially unacceptable, and we have to not let anyone smoke in public because of what we'll model to young children. And I just think this is so counterintuitive uh, and advances stigma. In this very moment when we've legalized, we still have this intense idea that on October 17th, anyone who consumes cannabis is going to run out of their house and light up in front of an infant and blow smoke in people's faces. All of the people that I know that have been consuming cannabis all of these years have not done that, and I don't think there's an appetite to do that, right? So this makes me very cynical and upset about the, the stigma that's still very pre prevalent and the assumptions in our public health community about who cannabis users are and, and what they will be doing post-legalization. So, so is, there, is there anything in the, the model that strikes as like, oh, that was done well or that was something that, that we think is um, on the right track? Well, I'm really happy about uh, in the federal regulation and then what we've seen roll out across the provinces in terms of setting the age of access uh, as low as possible at 18. We know that leading up to the federal legislation, there was lots of advocacy from health organizations, medical associations to set the age as high as 21 and 25. And I know Jenna and myself and other organizations and people representing you said, you know, this is just totally counterintuitive uh, when young people in the age ranges of 15 to 19 and 20 to 24 are the demographics with the, the highest rates of use. So if you shut people out of a legal market, you're, you're, you're diverting them to the illicit market and you effectively have a drug policy that doesn't impact the main group of users. So why legalize at all, right? Thanks. So uh, Jean-Sebastien, I want to sort of ask you the same question. Like, what are you, what's your general take on, um, on the cannabis? Uh, before answering, I just want to say I can understand English and speak in English, but uh, since we have translation and I better express myself in French, I'll, I'll answer in French, but I can take uh, answers, uh, questions in English. Ce qui est mauvais dans le, la, la légalisation, qui n'en est pas vraiment une, parce que ça reste encadré par le code criminel, probablement pour mieux respecter les conventions internationales, il y a beaucoup de choses. Euh, on, ça, le marché repose sur un oligopole et euh, exclut beaucoup de gens qui ont été euh, discriminés euh, par la prohibition et qui continuent d'être exclus euh, du marché légal. Et euh, ça favorise d'ailleurs le maintien d'un marché illégal et ça favorise le maintien des injustices sociales. Euh, dans certains cas aussi, on a empiré les peines, euh, aggravé les peines, par exemple... Euh, euh, la peine maximale de 14 ans de prison pour trafic aux mineurs, qui inclut euh, donner un joint euh, à un jeune, alors que pour l'alcool, ça n'a aucune commune mesure. Ça aussi, je pense que c'est bien qu'on ait été un peu plus dans une orientation de santé publique euh, pour le cannabis face à l'alcool, mais en même temps, je trouve que le discours est complètement incohérent. On, on stigmatise les consommateurs de drogue, même dans la légalisation, le, les, les consommateurs de cannabis, euh, puis euh, pourtant, euh, le discours pour euh, l'alcool est complètement euh, presque banalisant. Euh, ce qui est bien, c'est qu'on parle beaucoup de prévention, mais ce qui est mauvais, c'est qu'on ne la fait pas assez bien. La prévention, c'est très compliqué. Euh, la science de la prévention, ce n'est pas l'intuition, puis souvent la prévention jusqu'ici euh, est faite pour faire peur, puis euh, sur des préceptes politiques plutôt que scientifiques, et ce n'est pas du tout efficace, ça peut même nuire. La même chose pour la réduction des méfaits, on en voit, mais ce n'est pas assez. Et moi, ce que je pense qui est mal fait beaucoup, c'est le marketing, la mise en marché de la légalisation par le gouvernement Trudeau, 
qui, euh, puis même les gouvernements partout euh, provinciaux, euh, qui n'a pas expliqué à la population qu'on ne légalise pas le cannabis parce qu'il est bon pour la santé, mais parce que la prohibition est beaucoup pire et de loin. Et la nocivité, la toxicité de la prohibition pour notre société, ça a mal été expliqué à la population. Puis c'est pour ça que, en tout cas au Québec, on est les pires à travers le pays en termes d'acceptation de la légalisation. Euh, il y a une majorité de Québécois qui sont contre la légalisation du cannabis et euh, ça a fait défaut dans le débat. On ne parle pas du tout de la toxicité de la prohibition. Ça, je pense que ça a mal été fait. So, so you think largely some of the problem is, is just around public relations and how the government has presented uh, the, the reasons for legalization and some of the basis of it? Oui, mais aussi le discours prohibitionniste sous-jacent à la légalisation. Euh, je pense qu'on reste dans une logique, dans la, dans le, dans la façon d'en parler, on reste dans une logique de prohibition. On reste dans la stigmatisation de la consommation de cannabis. Et euh, euh, ça va jusque plus que dans le discours, ça va dans les dispositions de la loi aussi qui sont très sévères et même plus sévères qu'avant dans certains cas et qui peuvent produire des effets euh, pervers. Steve, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that there's a... If, if, if the new model in Canada seems overly restrictive in some ways, I think you have to bear in mind that uh, this is a very new thing, and we haven't even got to day one yet. And I think defaulting to a more restrictive model, I think there were political reasons for that, uh, to sort of counter some of the public concerns, some of the concerns from the opposition parties, some of the international concerns. And there were also practical considerations, because there are things we don't know about regulating cannabis. Um, and as we've seen with alcohol and tobacco, it's, it, it's very hard once you have a a uh, sort of mature, entrenched, commercialized market to try and row back if you feel it's under-regulated. So having an over-regulated market that then you can, that, that can then evolve based on evidence and maybe relax a bit um, is actually, I think, a, a precautionary approach, but probably a sensible one from a practical public health perspective uh, as well. And, uh, you know, I, it's something that we, we, we did recommend, not because I want a super restrictive model, And I don't think everything's perfect with the model. I think 80 or 90 percent of it's great. I think some of it is, is, is not so great. But there, there, are, you know, there are things we don't know. They're going to make mistakes. But policy can evolve. We can look at what happens, what works and what doesn't work, and we can adapt. And policy can move forward. So if, for example, uh, you know, the pl plain packaging is seen as too restrictive or uh, the sales, there aren't enough sales outlets or the marketing controls are too strict, Th those, yeah, I mean, I saw today that there was a, they're not going to allow celebrity endorsed branding of cannabis products. Now, for my mind, that's a great idea. I don't think you should have celebrity. I don't think you should have Rihanna branded weed. Uh, or, uh, it's ca on. Uh, sorry, it's, ca it's kind of Celine Dion branded <laughs> weed. Although I would buy those products if they were. <laughs> I love Celine. She's so great. <laughs> But, it, but, for us? But, but, but the point is that I, I think erring on the side of caution as a starting point, not just nationally, but internationally. I mean, yes, Uruguay, Uruguay has already done it, but it's a little country of three million. Jamaica is, is legalized for religious use. The Netherlands has had sort of informal coffee shop systems. But, you know, Canada is pioneering on this front. It's, the, it's a G7 country. Um, and the eyes of the world are on, Can uh, are on Canada to make sure that they do a good, you know, that, and, you know, it's really imperative that they don't mess this up. So being a bit more cautious on day one, for me, is not uh, an inappropriate starting point. But we can chill, we can chill and evolve um, as time goes on. Okay. May I Please. react to that quickly? Sure. Je suis d'accord, Steve, qu'il faut être prudent, plus prudent que, que, que moins. Mais je pense que euh, dans certains cas, pas partout, mais au Québec, c'est là que c'est le pire, c'est trop sévère. Et on risque d'avoir beaucoup d'effets pervers. Mais je suis d'accord, il faut commencer prudemment, mais pas trop prudemment, comme au Québec. Ça va s'empirer avec la CAQ au pouvoir, euh, avec un nouveau gouvernement majoritaire, populiste de droite qui veut interdire dans tous les lieux publics, augmenter l'âge à 21 ans. Euh, on va voir.
Okay, thanks. So, Jenna, Jenna, I, want, I wanted to ask you, uh, just, you know, as long as we're, like, slamming the cannabis, you know, beating, beating it down here a moment, a little bit, except for Steve. <laughs> He's jealous because he, he you I know. I said something good. <laughs> you said something good, too. Um, so, Jenna, I'm wondering, you've, you've written before um, and advocated for the idea of amnesty yeah. um, for cannabis, and, and one of the critiques you had was that it wasn't part of the initial um, regulation that was proposed. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about like what that, what that would mean and why it's important to have that and some other social justice yeah. uh, reparations, as you call them. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll start with you know, the recognition that legalizing cannabis in and of itself you know, has a social justice <laughs> lens to it, right? So you know, not to um, you know, not to hit that too hard, but also to think about you know what does it mean for the folks since we've talked about legalization in 2015 to now that have acquired um, you know possession charges for things that are going to be legal in two weeks, um, and also I think that this idea around kind of reparations around cannabis legalization also extends into industry and what kind of opportunities that we're creating to, to foster a kind of more diverse um, market. So this. Doesn't, you know, I'm not talking about you know, folks that have been running um, you know, dispensaries um, illegally for 10 years, even though I think that there is um, you know, a case to be made about facilitating their entry into the legal market, but more so around kind of the communities that have been over-policed for years and years. And it still blows my mind that in Canada, we don't actually collect race-aggregated data around um, arrests. Um, so I think that that's a really, really big problem, and it makes it really hard to kind of um, nail it down. We recently wrote a commentary around this, um, and some of the criticism that I got was, you know, you say that we're not collecting race aggregated data, and then you make the claim that, um, you know, arrests around cannabis is um, disproportionate, you know? So I think that there are some really big kind of holes in that argument. And then if we narrow that lens down on young people, like young people 18 to 25 in Canada have the highest number of um, drug-related arrests and over uh, and followed by young people 12 to 17 and over 80 percent of those are for cannabis possession alone so what does that really mean in the context of legalization when we're you know we're introducing legislation and I mean it's it's monumental globally but I just I don't know what happens when we're not introducing um, you know measures in tandem to kind of deal with all of these folks that have uh, you know like simple possession charges to start with so um, so yeah so I think that there are some really big and uh, critical gaps that we need to address and this idea that we're not even going to look at amnesty until it's legalized to me seems a little bit problematic um, you know someone told me recently that there people still have charges um, in Canada for for being gay from like years and years ago and those have never been wiped and those are still you know things that we've never dealt with so I'm just wondering you know what the mechanisms look like um, to ensure that we can get there on a, on a you know kind of a more integrative kind of social justice perspective on, on legalizing, because this is kind of like the model um, that maybe could open up a conversation to, um, you know, regulation of other drugs. So, you know, if, if we start doing that without actually addressing all of these kinds of really critical social justice issues, um, you know, I, I'm, I just find that a little bit problematic. Because underlying, underlying the whole rationale for why we need to legalize is, is largely that prohibition has been so bad. And so it's, it's about undoing, undoing some harm of it. And so, um, and, just, sure. just, um, <clears throat> there is some of the uh, U.S. state models um, have introduced... Massachusetts is a, re a really good example, probably the best example so far. They have a, a, a social equity program uh, with their new cannabis law that's, that's hardwired into the legislation. Um, whereby uh, people who have former ca uh, cannabis convictions, and not only are they expunged, but they are able to jump the queue in the licensing process to access uh, sales or production in, 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 the, in the new market. And, and more than that, uh, or, or if, and, and in fact, there, there's also a, a, a sort of queue jumping advantage for uh, poor, poor areas or areas that have been disproportionately impacted by cannabis enforcement. And they have an outreach program and a training program so that uh, people who want to participate from those areas can get training in marketing and horticulture and accountancy and all the rest of it so that they can participate on a, on a more uh, even playing field. So these things are beginning to happen and some of the US models are really worth looking at. Massachusetts, I would say in particular, and some of the California, California too. Cal some of the California models. 
So uh, it's, it's a shame that Canada hasn't done that, but I think it's not too late. There's no reason why those programs could not be introduced at a federal or provincial level going forward. Yeah, and I would also add that, you know, on the kind of business side and the idea of like fostering a more inclusive market, you know, Health, I'm, Health Canada has recognized this. They introduced a, a navigator program. So they have this program for <clears throat> folks who are working with Indigenous partners. And it's kind of, all it really is, though, is a direct line to Health Canada. If you're an applicant, I mean, that's probably pretty valuable. But, I mean, it still assumes, you know, a, a particular level of business acumen to, like, get to the point where folks would be applying. So, I mean, we're starting to see some things kind of unfold, but just, I think there needs to be kind of more help to kind of get there. So, um, Rebecca, I want to ask you, we, as we move forward, in uh, you know, and, and I think it's I think it's an experiment. I think it's fair to to say it's sort of a, a lot of unknowns about how legalization is going to work. Um, what do you what do you think are the best ways that we've already uh, people are already talking about evaluating how uh, cannabis regulation is going to work, and what do you think should be uh, in place? Like, what what kinds of things do you think we need to look at in order to to measure our success or failure? Yeah, I think we are starting somewhat behind because we don't have uh, the research infrastructure in place and we're just starting to, to roll out uh, grants that will, will fund this type of work. Um, I think we need a critical mass of trainees and academics with experience in cannabis and we're a bit late on that side, but we're getting there. Uh, I think we definitely need uh, coordination across municipalities within provinces and then across jurisdictions to look at what models are working and what are not. We have a wide variation and we have things rapidly changing as new governments come into power. So I think we need that evidence on the ground. You know, I was kind of disheartened by the, uh, the discourse around, well, you know, in Ontario, Rob Ford, he knows how to regulate cannabis. I don't think that we can say the Ontario government is really listening to evidence from drug policy. I think they have other motivations for the decisions they're making. Uh, so I think we need some coherent frameworks in place, uh, like we've done for other drug policy measures, uh, to see the success and failures, and in particular, the unintended consequences for communities. That's one of the things that we always have prioritized, uh, some of us were working in tobacco, that we've rolled out regulations to, to ban tobacco, of course. Uh, but there's been unintended consequences around gender, around other communities, and, and that's really important that we consider that as we evaluate. Je vous laisse mettre votre casque. Moi, je pense qu'en termes d'indicateurs de succès, il y a beaucoup de choses qu'il faut aller, beaucoup plus que juste regarder le nombre de consommateurs, mais de voir... Euh, la fréquence, les quantités, les modes de consommation, les façons de consommer, euh, les problèmes aussi, de, les, les, les conséquences négatives associées, pas juste mesurer combien de personnes consomment, comme si faut changer, dans le fond, euh, les impacts sur la consommation, aller voir les impacts sur les conséquences négatives, parce que franchement, la consommation, tant que c'est pas lié à des conséquences négatives, on s'en fout pas mal. Euh, puis il faut aussi regarder euh, les impacts en termes d'amélioration justement de toutes les conséquences négatives de la prohibition en termes d'insécurité, de, euh, de problèmes de santé, de criminalisation, d'injustice, de stigmatisation, euh, de problèmes de corruption euh, de, 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 à l'environnement, la, la, aux droits humains, euh, à la justice sociale, tout ça, il faut, faut tout regarder les impacts sur tout ça parce que jusqu'ici on a évalué les politiques en termes d'impact positif sur la consommation sans regarder les impacts négatifs, ce qui est complètement en porte-à-faux avec tout ce qui se fait en sciences politiques. Euh, normalement, on regarde aussi ce qui est « unintended consequences », comme on dit, les effets pervers, négatifs, mais sauf dans le domaine des drogues, ça, on ne regardait pas ça, mais il faut regarder tout ça. Um, I, I would I'd absolutely echo the, the, the comments we've heard so far. Um, I, I, I think that the Canadian model has got a pretty good Uh, evaluative monitoring system built into it. I'm sure it could be better, um, but it's probably, you know, in, globally, it's it probably the, the best we've seen in terms of cannabis policy monitoring. And they've at least, I think, importantly managed to get some baseline data before the legalization happens, so you've got something to compare to. Um, again, not as good as we might wish, but there's, there, there, is, there is something there. Um, one thing I think is worth flagging is the issue of... Um, Uh, how the market evolves in terms of corporate capture. Um, there's a, and, and I think that is something we need to keep a pretty close eye on. 
There's obviously uh, a real tension between the interests of uh, profit-making corporations and the interests of public health. Uh, you know, public health will seek to, you know, moderate use and minimize harm. Corporations are seeking to maximize profit, which may well is likely to be based on increasing use. Um, and th there is, you know, there are these billion dollar corporate sort of cannabis behemoths um, already uh, in existence, like Tweed and Tilray. And, uh, you know, I don't think they're evil or anything, but I think we need to be careful that the policy making process as we go forward it remains in the hands of the public health people and isn't sort of captured by corporate lobbyists. As, and and we, we've seen real danger with that with alcohol and tobacco historically. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree, but one of the critiques of um, the system where, you know, you, you've already talked about the, the prohibition on certain branding and trademarking is, so one of, one of the objectives is displacing what I would say is like a very normalized and ingrained black market where people, people are used to buying at a certain price with a certain, uh, from certain dealers at certain qualities. Like I think if companies are arguing, well, if we can't actually compete in that marketplace uh, equally, then, then that goal of displacing the black market may not happen. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's about, for me, it's about getting the balance right. You know, if your market's too restrictive, you won't displace the black market because people won't want to use it. If it's, if it's uh, not restrictive enough, you maybe open the door to sort of uh, corporate marketing of cannabis as a lifestyle thing for young people in a way that may not be uh, in the interest of public health. So, and you know, we have conflicting policy priorities here between reducing the black market and potentially and public health. And it's about getting the balance right. And there's no perfect answer, which is why we come back to the monitoring and evaluation. We need to see what's working and what's not and decide what our priorities are. Because often your prior policy priorities may be in conflict with each other. And the black market versus public health is a, is a classic example of that, which we've had with tobacco as well. Whack up the price of tobacco. Um, and you dissuade use, but you also encourage smuggling and, and undercutting. So there's a delicate balancing act, and we need to see what happens and, and, and base policy evolution on that evidence. And the priorities, the priorities of our society, could be in 10 years, 15 years, in a capitalist society, capitalist, neoliberal. And my fears are not on the day of the legalization. In fact, I have very few fears, but in 10, 20 years, we could see effectively a large industry and a delaying of the objectives of health public care to the objectives of rentability in a society that prioritizes the economy and the economic growth economic above and above. Yeah, I actually, just, just a, in quick response there, then I'll go to Jenna. I actually just, just read something yesterday that um, uh, the cannabis manufacturers were the largest lobbyists um, recently, so they had like the largest <laughs> amount of interactions with the government in the last years, like the, the, the large cannabis companies. And so a lot of this is sort of, I, I imagine it's getting, getting their input on the system, it's right, but I'm thinking part of it is also advocating for uh, loosened restrictions on, on and, some of the And marketing. they bring money to the government, uh, contrarily right. to public health people who cost money to get the government. Right. <laughs> Yeah, and it's really interesting because right now we're seeing a really big advertising push come from the licensed producers kind of right before October 17th. So they're kind of squeezing out all that they can kind of squeeze out before the regulations are introduced. But just to quickly go back to the question around metrics, I, one thing that I'm really interested in um, is around kind of looking at kind of the use of other substances and alcohol and tobacco and, and what can happen. I think that we're seeing a lot of research talk about kind of cannabis substitution um, effects, which is when people are either reducing or um, using in lieu of um, other substances. So I think that could be really, really interesting. I, I don't think the mechanisms are like quite as well understood, but I think, you know, I've heard someone ask, you know, will this result in kind of a public health net gain, which is kind of like an interesting way to um, think about it. So thinking around um, kind of measure, keeping a track of on those uh, metrics, I think would be very important as well. Yeah, and I'm not trying to be too cynical about what we monitor and evaluate, but as someone who works in the research world, you know, I've been advocating for proposals that come across my desk or other things that people ask for feedback on, that we not only focus on cannabis harms, right? There will be harm, then there will be benefits of legalizing at the public health level and also to the individual consumer in terms of their substance use, mental health, a whole range of factors. So please, let's not only focus on harms because we've always done that. There will be benefits and we need to research those as well. Totally agree. Displacement from alcohol to cannabis.
for example. So uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just, just to follow up, what, you know, like as, as policy advocates and researchers, we really believe that uh, evidence policy, policy should be evidence-based and driven, but I'm wondering, what's the role of public opinion in crafting drug policy? And, and I'm, thinking, I'm thinking largely, like, in beyond cannabis, like cannabis, there's 68% support of the pu of public, great, the government can act. Um, for, for some of the other uh, harder choices around things like legalizing or creating a regulated system of opioids to address the overdose crisis, uh, there may not be quite that uh, public support for it yet. So I'm wondering, what, what do you think is the proper role for public consultation around specific ways that regulation is rolled out and also just uh, action in the government? Ben, on vient de voir un exemple de ce qu'une population mal informée euh, peut faire euh, au Québec. Euh, je suis un peu cynique, euh, désabusé, mais euh, malheureusement, la population, une démocratie, ça marche bien quand la population est éduquée, informée, euh, qu'il y a une liberté de presse totale. Puis dans le cas du cannabis, c'est des politiques en matière de cannabis. Euh, il y a tellement une propagande, il y a même des corps médicaux qui disent des sottises. Euh, euh, et, et l'information qui se rend à la population et même aux élus, là, il y a plein d'élus à travers le pays qui prennent des décisions sur des choses très importantes sur la base d'informations qu'ils prennent dans les médias et sur un sujet qu'ils ne connaissent juste pas. Euh, dans ce contexte-là, je pense qu'il faut, euh, oui, faire des consultations, mais euh, il faut expliquer à la population pourquoi on fait les choses et oser aller de l'avant vers des mesures qui sont impopulaires, mais qui sont favorables pour la santé publique, pour le bien commun, pour la justice sociale. Parce que franchement, si on écoutait la population, euh, il y a bien des choses qu'on n'aurait pas faites, puis il y a bien des choses qu'on ferait qui seraient extrêmement nuisibles. Et je pense que malheureusement, c'est un beau cas où l'opinion publique doit être écoutée, mais il euh, faut avoir du courage politique pour aller au-delà de ce que la population pense. Um, I, I, public opinions, it, it, it's important, but I, I think more important is political leadership. Um, I think with, if you look at uh, harm reduction historically, um, a, a lot of harm reduction interventions, when they were rolled out, were, did not have popular support. Um, and, and often didn't have political support either. It was civil society and activists who pushed these things forward, proved they worked, and then the support came later. Um, with, with cannabis, I mean, in, in, in Canada, it was kind of easy because you already had majority support for it. So, you know, the, the politicians followed the support. In, in Uruguay, interestingly, um, President Mojica pushed forward cannabis legalization um, and had about 30% support. Uh, he, and he, when he was asked, why are you doing this? He said, because it's the right thing to do. And it's kind of like, whoa, what a weird idea that a leader would do something because it was the right thing to do and show leadership. Um, but, yeah, but, now, but now it has, uh, it's approaching 50%. So, and, and there are many examples. that we, in, in the UK, the uh, tobacco smoking in public places, uh, in public buildings, uh, that was, did not have popular support when it was introduced. And now it has overwhelming popular support. Um, again, you, you had public health people making a case, showing leadership, um, and then the support comes afterwards. So I think there's a critical thing here for, I mean, it, w wouldn't it be nice if politicians could show leadership? And, okay, you, you've got legal cannabis here, so it's not an issue, but in the, just to say, we don't have legal cannabis in the UK. 98% of the world doesn't have legal cannabis. Um, we don't even have medical cannabis in the UK. So just be, when, you're, when you're belly aching about the new legislation, just be grateful. You can buy it in shops, you can get it online, you can grow it in your garden. That's, that's a pretty good start. But, but, it's um, expensive. Yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but, I can't, but, but, but I can't moving, smoke it right here. <laughs> but moving, moving forward, we're, we're now, we're, I, cannabis is kind of easy in terms of the regulation debate relative to other drugs. And you're, you're absolutely right. With drugs that, don't have, that have a lot more social stigma and social fear around them, it's, it's a much harder um, case to make. And that's where we're going to need the leadership. And that's where you need to push your leaders to... to, to, to don't just say, look, do we have to drag you forward on this? The logic is the same. The reasoning is the same. Um, can you show leadership and make this happen? Don't wait till the opinion polls. Don't wait till we sue you in the Supreme Court. Actually lead on this one. It would be incredibly welcome change. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I just want to say, but in between the, the politicians and the, and the public, there's the powerful stakeholder groups that represent public health and medical communities like the Canadian Medical Association, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, and Jean-Sebastien wrote this uh, great op-ed, it was in La Presse, uh, translated to English as, you know, cannabis legalization is making psychiatrists crazy. Uh, and, and, you know, it wasn't a stigmatizing term when you say, uh, fou in French, right? So. <laughs> Uh, and I think it's true, like this is what I've dealt with in the, the worlds that I walk in and in the policy conversations I have, is the pushback around, um, you know, protecting youth and protecting young brains and, you know, when we legalize, we're putting young people's brains and mental health and their future trajectories into successful employment and school ed education at risk. And it's just a bunch of neoliberal claptrap, clap right? Like as if cannabis is the one thing that's going to be the lynch pin in a young marginalized person's trajectory, right? This is what I have been trying to fight against, and I know Jenna and other people, you know, this type of dialogue, this is where we also need to work in the policy community uh, to people who are very resistant to this change. You know, I wish people were as angry about poverty and trauma and violence and how that affects the developing brain, not cannabis alone. Just to kind of echo what Rebecca said, like in a space where, you know, I'll, I'm doing a lot of work with Canadian students for sensible drug policy, helping them advocate for themselves. We think that there's, you know, it, it becomes this like, you know, learning how to engage in advocacy with perhaps government bodies and with the public, especially being able to kind of frame messaging in ways that are still, uh, you know, received well, that are palatable, that make sense, um, has become kind of what we do. We figure out ways that we can, you know, we can talk about the Drug Free Kids Canada Toolkit without totally blasting it, but say, you know, it's missing harm reduction. You know, what are we offering young people that are already using cannabis? Those are toolkits, like half a million of those have gone out across Canada, and there's not even a mention of, you know, any kind of actual, you know, harm reduction tips or tools for young people who are using cannabis. Um, and I always, what's really stuck to me is when Rebecca had said to me once, like, I wish you know, kind of these public, like that public health messaging would stick as hard as the brain development stuff has, has, has seems to have stuck. And it just seems that, you know, no matter what you say, no matter what evidence you present, there was recently a, uh, a meta-analysis, like systematic review, review in JAMA Psychiatry that reviewed all the available evidence on uh, cognition and cannabis use. And they, I think it was, it was about 70 studies that fit the criteria. And they found that, um, you know, all of this discussion discussion around cannabis use causing um, various impacts on brain development are of little to no clinical importance. You know, and that happened, and that was out there, and, and you kind of see that, and you're like, oh, right, so finally, maybe that debate can kind of be laid to rest, but it's as if it never happened. It, th that messaging is just too ingrained in how we talk about youth and cannabis. So I think a lot of it becomes strategy, you know, finding really, you know, helping young people being, uh, being able to, uh, you know, get in front of Health Canada and, and talk about what what their concerns are. Um, so yeah, a strategy, <laughs> just a lot of strategy. I, I just want to jump on that. Uh, non seulement le, 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 le guide pour des jeunes sans drogue de Santé Canada ne parle pas de réduction des méfaits, mais euh, à la fin, on donne des conseils aux parents sur comment répondre à des questions des adolescents. Et euh, ça allait jusqu'à la dernière question où on dit de dire à un adolescent qui vous demande si vous avez déjà consommé de la drogue, du cannabis. Euh, si vous en avez déjà consommé, de, de répondre, euh, quote, euh, oui, mais ce n'est que par une très grande chance que je n'ai pas eu de conséquences catastrophiques. Ce qui est complètement faux et qui est exactement ce que je disais tantôt, qui est démontré scientifiquement comme étant non seulement pas efficace, mais nuisible, parce que ça discrédite complètement les messages de prévention auprès des jeunes et ils n'écoutent plus rien ensuite. Yeah, thank you. So, um I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and talk a bit more like prospective. Like, what what does you know? And maybe the answer is it doesn't. Like, what what does it mean for uh, drug policy within Canada? And also, Steve, maybe you can talk a bit about internationally. What does it mean that Canada is uh, legalizing cannabis uh, in, in the big? in the big sphere of things uh, for future changes in drug policy. Like I think we know, we know now that you know, our, uh, our government has sort of 
uh, closed the door uh, on discussions around decriminalization or legalization of other drugs, uh, which is which is very frustrating and um, and hopefully a temporary state uh, that we can convince them is the wrong policy, particularly in the face of uh, overdose crisis and harms. But um, uh, you know, at some point, the discussion around regulating beyond uh, cannabis is is going to happen. And I'm wondering, you know, is is it important that we get cannabis right? Is it important? Does it uh, set up certain practices or policy um, avenues that we that we will follow with evaluation or the system that we'll use to regulate that will be important? I mean, uh, you know, as someone who, uh, who's not from Canada but is involved in the sort of international uh, drug policy scene and, and does stuff at the UN, um, I, I, it's worth emphasizing just how important the Canadian reforms are for the international debate. And, and, and Canada, to, uh, to their great credit, have been very clear and very strong in their statements in uh, international forums and, and at the UN. They've, they, they, they haven't run away from it. They've, they, 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 they've taken pride in it and, and, and made, made statements that have been very clear. And they have, and you may be completely uninterested in this, but the international treaty system, which says that you can't legalize cannabis, and, uh, and Canada is now, is now in non-compliance with the treaties that it has ratified, this is a big issue. Canada is, a, is an important player at the UN, and it's now in non-compliance with one of the UN treaties, which is a big, it's a big deal. Um, but it's making a case uh, explaining why it's doing it, it on the terms that you, you explained, Scott, and also beginning to make a case that the treaties are outdated and like the uh, Canadian laws and like the drug laws in most countries, need to be revisited and modernized. And I can't emphasize how important that is for the international debate. So um, aside from your d domestic parochial concerns, um, you know, th th this is very, particularly because uh, Canada is a, a very important, respected player on the international stage and is a member of the G7 and the Security Council. It is very, very significant internationally. Um, and, you know, you, you should take some pride in that, that Canada is, has not run away from that and it is engaging actively in the, in the, on the international stage. So I just wanted to, if you weren't aware of that, I wanted to let you know it, it's, it's very important. Thanks. Um, Oui, moi, je suis très content de voir que... Parce que je, je, en 2008, avant la crise économique, avant l'apparition de la Global Commission on Drug Policy, je ne pensais jamais voir la légalisation du cannabis de ma vie. Et là, je réalise qu'on s'approche peut-être aussi de décriminaliser, légaliser d'autres drogues, ce qui est très intéressant. Puis je pense qu'effectivement, le débat sur le cannabis, les arguments pour la légalisation du cannabis s'appliquent aussi pour la légalisation d'autres drogues. Euh, peut-être pas toutes, on n'a pas besoin de toutes, mais presque toutes les drogues. Euh, et la crise des opioïdes aussi a contribué effectivement à un sentiment d'urgence qui a même mené euh, les, les directions de santé publique euh, des trois plus grandes villes, Montréal, Toronto, Vancouver, à prendre position et à demander expressément au gouvernement fédéral de décriminaliser les drogues, ce qui est quand même intéressant. Euh, Il y, a, il y a aussi un contexte international avec la Global Commission on Drug Policy, avec le dernier rapport même qui va jusqu'à demander de réguler, encadrer toutes les drogues. Um, il y a le British Medical Journal, you don't have uh, cannabis legalized, but you have the British Medical Journal, qui a signé des éditoriaux dont le dernier, le 10 mai, de la plume de... De, de, de Fiona Godley, de l'éditrice en chef, qui dit uh, « Drugs should be uh, legalized, regulated and taxed so, ». C'est quand même le, le British Medical Journal. Je ne veux pas faire un argument d'autorité, mais ça traduit un consensus chez certains euh, scientifiques, médecins et tout ça. Euh, là, le débat, il se situe entre décriminaliser ou légaliser chez les experts. Euh, moi, je suis d'avis que la décriminalisation ne suffit pas. Euh, non seulement elle est hypocrite, mais elle ne règle pas des problèmes fondamentaux, des conséquences négatives de la prohibition, de l'interdiction et de la décriminalisation, c'est-à-dire la stigmatisation des consommateurs, par exemple. Ça ne règle pas du tout ça, la décriminalisation. Ça reste quelque chose d'interdit et de mauvais. 
Euh, et la stigmatisation, je n'ai pas le temps de développer, mais ça a énormément de conséquences négatives, euh, notamment euh, la demande d'aide, euh, puis de, 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 des contrôles informels aussi, sociaux. Mais bon, ça ne contrôle pas du tout la qualité, la décriminalisation des produits. Euh, ça n'est pas un argument suffisant, la, les, les revenus, mais l'État paye pour les dépenses. Alors, pourquoi se priver de revenus puis de créer des économies parallèles qui déstabilisent les économies licites, qui créent de la corruption, puis aussi toute la question de la criminalité, des marchés criminels et la violence qui en découle. Tout ça, la décriminalisation ne règle pas. Puis oui, je pense que le futur, c'est la décriminalisation d'abord. J'espère le plus rapidement possible. Ça devrait déjà être fait. On ne devrait plus criminaliser aucune personne euh, qui possède des drogues. C'est d'un ridicule consommé. On va regarder ça dans 50 ans. On va voir l'absurdité de de, de, de pénaliser des gens qui ont besoin d'aide et de, les, de leur nuire davantage et de, de pénaliser des gens qui n'ont pas de problème et qui leur en créer un de toutes pièces en leur euh, imposant des peines. Bref, euh, je pense qu'il faut aller vers la légalisation et je pense que tout ça nous mène à ce débat-là et j'espère qu'on va continuer malgré la signature récente de Justin Trudeau de, du, du, du pacte de renouvellement de la War on Drugs de Trump, euh, probablement dans un jeu politique pour le convaincre de quelque chose d'autre, euh, peut-être l'ALENA. Euh, mais voilà. Merci. So, um I, I think we have uh, time for just a couple questions, and I'll, I'll ask maybe a couple of our panelists to hand down to to hand down mics for the stands here. Um, and so maybe somebody from the audience, or Marlis, would be kind enough to kind enough to um, do them. Do you want to, do you want to just go up to the mic stand uh, if you have a question? Just there's a mic coming soon. Shay has it right here. She can hand it to you. Oh. Uh, do you want me to ask it here? Do you want me to ask it? No, you can ask it right there. Okay. I'm going to ask you a question in French. So I'll let you take your mask. So my question is quite simple, but maybe a question more complicated. So what is the role that you envisage for the producers, licensees, in the research and in the education? So is it about the donation of the part of the producers, licensees, or a fund Euh, unifié, centralisé, euh, à partir duquel on pourrait faire de la recherche et euh, de l'éducation. Merci. Um, C'est une question très complexe. Euh, dans le meilleur des mondes, la recherche elle est totalement indépendante. Euh, mais la recherche financée, euh, elle existe partout. Ce qui est important, a, a priori, c'est d'avoir l'indépendance euh, du chercheur euh, dans ce qu'il peut dire, publier. Mais c'est pas parfait. On a vu le, 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 le 10 septembre 2011, la veille, euh, 2001, pardon, la veille du 11 septembre là, du World Trade Center, les 11 éditeurs des plus grands journaux euh, scientifiques dans le domaine médical, pharmaceutique, je me souviens plus, on se sont réunis pour dire maintenant, on veut que les chercheurs signent, qui ont le droit de publier ce qu'ils veulent. Euh, et, et de dire ce qu'ils veulent quand c'est financé par l'industrie. Mais là, le, 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 le fardeau est maintenant sur les épaules du chercheur. Ce n'est pas parfait, mais c'est quand même ça et ça existe. Et je pense qu'il faut faire place à ça. Mais dans le meilleur des mondes, il y aurait peut-être des fonds communs, des dons, euh, des consortiums, mais idéalement des, des, des financements désintéressés à des fonds de recherche euh, administrés de manière indépendante. Mais on peut faire quand même de la recherche, je pense, en, en attendant, puis même ça va toujours continuer, je pense. Yeah, I, 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 I think I agree with you. I, th I think research and uh, public health education, so on, should be funded because it's the right thing to do. It shouldn't be dependent on donations from industry or how much cannabis is being consumed. Okay, thanks. Do you have a question? I'm just wondering what your opinion is on the pending legalization and the effect that it's having on the medical community. So for example, in the province that I'm from, um, you are going to be no longer able to medicate outside or you'll be facing a fifty to $2,000 per offense fine. And the legal driving limit that's been set as two to five nanograms, a medical patient who uses every day can have 12 times the amount in their system at all times. So I'm just wondering what your opinion is on the legalization and all the different laws that are cropping up from that for the medical community. 
Um, so I'm just going to hit on the, the driving piece because I think that that's really um, interesting. And we did a report with Canadians for Fair Access to Medical Cannabis that just kind of reviewed these considerations. And the bottom line is there isn't actually a lot of research on medical cannabis use and driving. And in fact, we were reading a paper this morning um, that was actually showing, um, it was a case, in, case study in Switzerland where they legalized cannabis that has a THC under 1%, so predominantly CBD strains. What they found was that even um, after consuming a, a, a CBD strain with less than 1% THC, they were still um, testing over the two uh, nanogram uh, to, to five nanogram limit. So, I mean, this raises, you know, very interesting concerns for physicians because in my experience, physicians have actually would advise patients if you need to, you know, kind of drive during the day or, you know, continue your activities of daily living that you should be using CBD strains during the day and maybe you know, more predominant THC strains at night. So this, this new study really complicates that now, right? Because I was on a thread with physicians and they were all like, you know, for the last five, 10 years, this is how we've been advise, advising our patients, but now we're not really sure what to do. So I think that the driving laws as they stand, um, you know, do have a, a, a big risk to um, criminalize uh, medical cannabis patients for managing their symptoms. There's also a little bit of work with um, conditions such as MS that show, and of, and of course we, we could say that symptoms from conditions are impairing in and of themselves, and that there may be a role that cannabis plays in, um, in helping drivers um, who suffer from conditions such as MS are actually less impaired, you know, after, after they've um, been able to medicate. So I think it's a really, really complicated um, picture. I think that there are, some, um, there are some countries globally that have carve-outs, for example, for medical cannabis patients, but it isn't quite um, clear how that's um, going to play out. I don't have more of a concrete answer, but definitely recognizing that that's a, a really big issue. And, you know, even when we're thinking about young people and driving rules, there's a lot of provinces. I know Quebec is, is no zero tolerance across the board, not, um, yeah, <laughs> zero tolerance um, for THC across the board in, in one system. But, you know, Ontario is under 21 and for novice drivers. And again, I mean, there's something there. If, if cannabis stays in our bloodstream for up to seven days and we have no actual indicators of impairment, only presence of THC, uh, then I think, you know, so there are some really um, important questions there. And, the, and these are probably going to be legally challenged, I think, with, with the will. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the link between uh, blood content and impairment is, is very confusing with, with, with cannabis, and it's not a good indicator in the way it is with alcohol. So I think um, particularly the per, per se uh, laws relating to blood uh, THC content are, are generally not a good idea, and it should be an impairment-based system. Um, uh, but you know uh, that that needs work. But I, I, the, I just as a final comment on this, uh, it, the legal status of cannabis shouldn't really be a factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, if driving whilst impaired, it should be uh, not allowed, whatever the legal status of a drug is. Uh, so it shouldn't re that shouldn't really make. It, I mean, it's a complicated issue either way. And we don't have blood tests or saliva, saliva tests for fatigue. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. Right. So. <laughs> And then, unfortunately, we're out of time. I see you there, Erica. But maybe, um, maybe, folks, if you have additional questions, you can round up some of the panelists who are here at the, at the conference and uh, ask them after this. But anyway, thank you to uh, the great um, uh, panelists here who are really insightful, and thank you for your attention. And yeah, I would love that. I follow you.